So now we start our introduction to the tools you'll need in nanoscience and particularly chapter 2 quantum mechanics. For those of you who are completely unfamiliar with uh, atomic physics, let me recommend this book, The Making of the Atomic Bond by Richard Rhodes. The age of quantum mechanics began when Max Planck realized that he could solve a fundamental problem in the thermodynamics of radiation emission by a heated body by postulating that energy was absorbed and emitted in distinct packets of energy and that these packets of energy contained an amount of energy uh, given by the product of Planck's constant times the frequency of the radiation. Um, later on de Broglie uh, generalized this idea to the idea that perhaps uh, freely propagating electrons uh, had associated with them a frequency or a wavelength. Now, it, it turns out that this picture is not really quite so simple, but let me tell you why many people believe that particles have wave-like properties. One of the ways that we know waves are waves is that they will show the phenomena of diffraction and interference. So you see here a wave hitting a small slit and it diffracts outwards from the slit. In the case of two sources, the waves will interfere to form crests and troughs and a standing wave pattern. So if you take electrons and uh, make two sources of electrons, in this case by putting a wire biprism in an electron microscope, so there's a source here of highly monochromatic electrons. They can pass either to the left or the right of this bioprism and then land on a screen below it. Uh, you see what looks like an interference pattern. But in the experiment I'm about to show you, the intensity of the electron microscope was turned down to such a low level that there was only one electron in the column at a time. So the probability of having two electrons in the column was minuscule and therefore, there's no probability that one electron can interfere with another. And yet, as you watch now this, we are looking at the you see the interference. The monitor. Bright spots appear here and there. These spots indicate individual electrons. Electrons are sent out only occasionally. Therefore, the chance of finding one electron in the microscope is very small. Not to mention the chance of finding two. Uh, since electrons are detected one by one as particles, we have to conclude that each electron must have passed through at random on either side of the biprism, thus creating a uniform distribution without any interference when accumulated. Under such conditions do electrons form a uniform distribution? But look, we begin to see some fringes in the perpendicular direction that looks like interference fringes. Since this experiment lasted for more than 30 minutes, I have sped the movie up. Interference fringes are now clearly visible. That was the voice of Dr. Akira Tonomura at Hitachi Labs who carried out that experiment. So here are some of the key points of quantum mechanics. Unlike classical mechanics, where once you know the starting position and velocity of a particle, you can, from Newton's uh, laws, predict its behavior at any future time. In quantum mechanics, you can only make probabilistic behavior of the most likely uh, position for finding a particle. Quantum mechanics provides the tools for doing this. The distributions are wave-like, as you saw in that movie, and the wavelength associated uh, with those particles, originally first calculated by de Broglie for a free electron, are so small that quantum effects are usually not apparent. But this is a class in nanoscience, so they'll matter to us. So in this chapter, we will develop the rules of quantum mechanics. We'll introduce the idea of a wave function, which is a tool for calculating this probability. We'll talk about wave functions when there's more than one particle involved. The Schrodinger equation, which is like Newton's laws of motion, but in the quantum mechanical world, will solve the Schrodinger equation for some simple problems in one dimension. We'll talk about atoms, the periodic table, and then how to calculate complex problems from 
small changes to problems we've already solved, and then chemical bonds, and finally uh, a new and very valuable technique called density functional theory. So one way to see how this wave-like behavior comes from problems associated with measurement itself is to ask what would happen if we tried to tell which side of the uh, beam splitter the electron was passing through in that two-slit electron diffraction experiment. Now to um, analyze this, we'll go to the formula that, that, that de Broglie introduced. Uh, what de Broglie did was to say that there was a wavelength associated with an electron equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the electron. So classically, this is just the <clears throat> mass of the electron times its velocity. So this is the expression here for the so-called de Broglie wavelength of an electron. Remember, once again, it's not actually the wavelength of the electron, but rather has something to do with the probability of measurement and how that changes with position. So if we send these things with wave-like properties through a slit, then the classical uh, diffraction formula for the first maximum in the diffraction pattern shown here, that is the angle where this path from this slit to this point and this slit to this point add up exactly in phase, is when that path difference is, is an integral number of um, uh, wavelengths, and so for the first diffraction, um, maximum n equals 1, and the angle is given by the inverse sine of the ratio of the wavelength to the spacing of the two slits. So if we plug de Broglie's formula into this expression, we see then that the uh, angle for the first maximum, so let's write it down over here, we'll take the first maximum, n equals 1, is going to be given by the inverse sine of h over d p. Now, supposing we set up an experiment to measure which side of the slit the electron passed. We might do this with a very powerful laser beam. The idea would be to place detectors each side of the pair of slits and measure the scattering from the electron as it passes either this side or this side and see if it was more intense, for example, in D2 than D1. And that would tell you then that the electron passed through this slit and not this slit. But there is a catch. Photons have a momentum associated with them. Uh, Einstein showed this originally. Einstein's a relativistic expression for the momentum of a photon was that it's just given by the ratio of its energy to the speed of light. Of course, a photon has no mass. That's why the classical formula can't be used. And since the energy is given by Planck's constant, this then is equal to just h over lambda, because c is f lambda. So, we have an expression for the momentum of a photon. Now, the constraint is that the wavelength of the photon has to be much less than the spacing d between the slits, or you'll never resolve which uh, detector has more light intensity in it, because if the wavelength is much bigger than these slits, then each detector will receive an equal amount of scattered light, and you'll never know where the electron went. So, if the electron has a momentum on the order of h over lambda, and the particle has a momentum on the order of h over lambda, then the momentum imparted to the particle by the probing light is of the same order of magnitude as the momentum of the probing light. And therefore, the particle will be scattered by an angle that is greater than the angle of the first diffraction um, maximum. So you will not be able to determine which slit the electron went through without spoiling the interference pattern that was characteristic of quantum mechanics in the first place. This is a hallmark of a very important principle called the uncertainty principle, and we'll turn to that next.